Yeah, okay. So chapter six is called Dealing with Sexual Exploitation. And in it, I examine some research that's been done on the sexual exploitation of adults by religious leaders. I also ask the question, how do other professionals or how do other professional establishments deal with sexual, sexually violated boundaries between the professional and the client? And also how does the judicial system deal with sexual exploitation by those in a professional capacity? And lastly, in the end of that chapter, I ask the question, or well, pose the question, how should the church deal with some of these matters, um, specifically sexual abuse matters by leaders? That's number six. So chapter, and chapter seven is called How Satan Attacks the Church. Um, I've said Christians that do not acknowledge or minimize the reality of the demonic are, in, are at a disadvantage. And I look at the characteristics of demons and how they, the, how they have the ability to operate through a leader's weaknesses or unhealed wounds, causing a great deal of pain and hurt to those that they are leading or supposed to be leading. Chapter eight is called Forgiveness. Um, and that's a very, it's a very key component to the healing journey is forgiveness. It really has to start there. Um, then I ask a question about and discuss why do people find it hard to, to forgive? What, what makes it difficult for people to understand forgiveness and to actually forgive and release others in forgiveness? And then I also look at the consequences of living with an unforgiving heart or living with bitterness in our hearts, because there are spiritual consequences to that. Chapter nine is called The Importance of the Body of Christ. And I've said a lack of, un a lack of understanding and or a sinful response to negative church experiences is the reason that some people decide to do their Christian walk by themselves, being detached from the body of Christ. But it's actually a major deception and a ploy of Satan to separate the sheep from the flock. And lastly, chapter 10 is my own personal story, where I journey through my life and give an insight into some of the deception the manipulation, the domination, the control, and the trauma that I personally experienced in churches during my life. So that's my brief overview of my 10 chapters. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose one of the big ones in chapter six, when I talk about dealing with sexual exploitation, it's an issue that this church has struggled to deal with properly because when sometimes they hear about a, a church leader being sexually involved in, with a congregant, some words come up instantly. People talk about an affair or a relationship, but it's nothing of the sort. It's actually sexual abuse. It's sexual exploitation. Why? Because there is a power imbalance be between someone who's in a position of leadership and someone who's coming to them for to receive ministry or is under their pastoral care. So, but in the church world today, there is a bit of misunderstanding about that. And what can happen many times, the person who's actually been victimized by a leader can become re-victimized by the church because they don't have the the, the, the understanding, for, even from a scriptural perspective, of how to deal with the situation, and they end up re-victimizing the person all over again. I often hear from, pe from pe people that um, going through the, the, the way the church dealt with the, the abuse was more horrific than the actual sexual abuse in the first place. So churches do have to really um, look at this issue. Some churches aren't, more churches are looking at it now, but it's still a very, very tentative issue, and people struggle to deal with it effectively because they go by their emotions and they just say what they think but without looking at it from a spiritual <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Um, I've seen how Satan attacks the church. There's a big, it is a sad reality that people don't, or people in the church don't really acknowledge the, the power of the enemy. I'm not trying to boost him up and say there's anything massive, but the, the, the fact is that we do have a spiritual enemy. It's a reality. He's there and we need to be able to deal with him and understand how to um, defend ourselves and counterattack his attacks on us. So churches who don't understand this or don't believe in the devil or minimize his effects are a real disadvantage because he will be operating in their lives undercover without people really realizing what's going on. Yeah. So it's really, really key. It's not that we have to really big up the devil, I'm not saying that, but we do have to have an understanding, a basic understanding of our enemy and how he can operate because it will actually save people a lot of hurt and a lot of grief. And churches need to really be more um, in tune with this. I, I, I think, personally, I think every single church should have at least a few people that know how to do deliverance. It's really, really important. Very, very important. Because it's an area that some churches don't touch on at all. 
and people can sit in the congregation for quite a while being in bondage and not realize it. So it's a very, very important area. Um, forgiveness is a big one because people sometimes don't understand what forgiveness is about. Sometimes they feel that forgiveness may be a, um, is like letting someone off the hook or um, almost like saying to, to the person what they did was okay, but it isn't. It's just forgiveness is between us and God. It has literally has nothing to do with us and the person that's offended us, really. It's about our relationship with God. And if we decide not to forgive the other person for whatever they may have done to us, um, that has consequences and bearing on our relationship with God. So forgiveness is a very, very powerful tool that enables us to heal, enables us to release ourselves from negative things that have happened to us in the past and enables us to walk in that liberty that Christ purchased, <coughs> sorry, that purchased, <coughs> excuse me, that Christ purchased for us on the cross at Calvary. And the importance of the body of Christ. Many believers now are kind of doing their own thing. Sometimes because they've been hurt, they've been injured, they've been insulted, they've been offended. And they decide they want to serve Christ by themselves in some sort of, uh, yeah, just by themselves without the church body being part of their lives. And it's understandable why people feel like that. But it's actually a ploy of Satan. He wants to get us separated. But Christ was the one who made the body of Christ. He put us together as a body. It's almost like if you had a, in a human, uh, human body, a hand or foot can't operate by itself. The hand, the feet, the legs and the arms, even the internal organs, they all work together to complement each other together. And they work together as a whole. And that's how Christ ordained us as a body of Christ. Interestingly, in that chapter, chapter I also talk about the gifts of the spirit. How the gifts of the spirit are for us to complement each other and work with each other. It's not necessarily for us to work by ourselves as lone rangers. So the, the body of Christ is very, very important. It's something that Jesus Christ in instituted. But the enemy is really, really getting people to believe because of what they've been through, that they don't need the body of Christ because they've been hurt there or they've been hurt there. But the bottom line is there's no perfect church anyway. There is no perfect church. We just have to accept the fact that there will be people with their shortcomings and do our best to keep on serving God um, with hopefully with some healthy friends and healthy other um, Christians around us wherever possible. And lastly, my, my personal story, quite... Um, I'll go into quite some detail in my story about what happened to me in churches from the time I was a child, um, some of the racism, racism I experienced, some of the bullying, and a lot of the trauma I experienced by some pastors, even later on in life, that were actually working and operating in witchcraft. At the time, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea they were operating in witchcraft and doing a lot of really dodgy things in the background. But um, So I explained that, and I explained how I came out of that and how it got me... Got, got, got me to actually, me and my wife really, to challenge some of these demonic um, <laughs> institutions really, which is quite a challenge. But God brought me through it and he gave me this, this courage and the strength to stand up and say, you know what, these things are wrong and that they need to be called out and they need to be dealt with. Yeah, and we, and we did it. So yeah, so that's, that's the, 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 the 10 chapters of my book. It should be coming out soon. I actually talked to the, the um, publishers today and I've now given, given the permission to release the final draft so I should be getting, we should be getting a hard copy very, very soon. And I'll let everyone know. And Derek, Eric, you'll definitely get your copy in the post. <laughs> <laughs>